Hello everyone, it's uh, good evening and good afternoon and good morning maybe. Um, we are here today uh, to hear uh, two presentations, one by Roland who is going to speak about viral art and also a presentation of a project by the collective BioBabes. So we are going to start with Roland and then go to BioBabes and then we will have some time for questions and answers and just like hanging together and, and talk. So Roland van Dinderog is an Oslo-based artist and researcher combining techniques from biology and media technology. His interests include the translation of complicated processes and concepts into public experiences as he has done with topics like emergence, ecosystems, and microscopic interactions with media ranging from robotics, genetics, to living matter. His past exhibitions include the Earth Electronica Festival, London Design Festival, and the Discovery Festival. Next to his practice, he also likes to teach and create the conditions for stimulating art science collaborative projects. In this context, he was leading the Biohack Academy at Hack, uh, helped set up uh, the biospace at the Utrecht University of the Arts and founded Amsterdam Biolabs. Roland is going to share a selection of viral art. Hey, thanks Carolina for the introduction. Yeah, so I want to um, share with you this um, collection of uh, viral arts projects, which are um, basically a, a collection of projects doing with uh, arts and viruses, which is um, topical, I would say right now, because we're all living through a pandemic. And um, um, I guess part of my background is uh, I've been in the media technology program a bit similar to the Media Lab, but then at Leiden University at the Leiden Institute of Advanced Computer Science. And computer scientists always like to kind of categorize things and put them in boxes. And it's also something that I like to do. So I'm also kind of a big collector of, of things and uh, of projects. And um, <laughs> this, I guess, is one example of this. And um, it is going to be a website which I'm building at the moment with Pai Yingling. Uh, it's not yet, so you kind of get a sneak preview here of the viral art collection we built. Um, it came out, next slide. It came out of, um, next slide, Carolina, you have to click. It came out of a workshop I teach together with Pei Yingling um, about viral art at the Breitner Academy uh, in Amsterdam. It's called Art Tech Lab. Uh, for our art. And in this workshop, um, I'll just read the text to you. In this workshop, we will, no, last uh, previous one, yeah. Uh, in this workshop, we will get to know viruses and a society as the pandemic unfolds. Following existing work from different artists, you get introduced to various strategies and methodologies for visualizing the unseen and inventing new behaviors. Examples of output include performances, movies, object site-specific research, do-it-yourself design solutions, paintings, and public interventions. The goal of the workshop is to develop a playful approaches that help you to navigate through the current pandemic in a creative way. So this was the brief of the, 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 the workshop we did, the course, which was five uh, weeks. This is artwork um, by Pei Ying on the background, which I'll come back to later. Um, but so we showed all these examples of different arts to do with viruses in this course, so we collected those. And next slide. Um, next. And this collection of, no, previous. Sorry, we have some delay. And this um, uh, collection of arts and viruses, uh, we categorized in seven um, categories. I want to say these are not all kind of recent artwork because you see now that a lot of art is reacting to the pandemic, but these are. Uh, um, projects to do with viruses, which are some of them are really much older. And I think it's uh, interesting of art that you can um, kind of look at this work in the context of today uh, and see them uh, having a new relevance and also um, seeing have a new relevance. And sometimes they're also really prescient in a way that you think, wow, these people kind of 
uh, this art works um, preceded or kind of, uh, you know, they thought about these things so many years before they were so important as they are now. So we have seven categories here. One, behavior and interactions. Two, viral structure. Three, contagious zombies. Uh, four, real viral art. Five, misinformation and coding information. Six, politics and economic effects. And seven, vaccination. And I'm going to show you a couple of projects in each of these. And if you have uh, more projects to add later, just contact me. That would be great. Next. Um, so this is the first uh, project. This is by Pei Ying Ling, who I work together. So Pei Ying Ling, uh, I should introduce her a bit because uh, she was part of this, is an artist designer from Taiwan and she's currently based in Eindhoven. And her main focus is combination of science and human society through artistic methods. Um, and uh, this project specifically, Tame is to Tame. She did this, um, this dance, this is still from a video which you can find on her website as well. And she did, it, it's about behavior and interactions, right? So um, this dancer has these um, wooden things on her elbows so she cannot touch anything. So she can go in this world where there's a virus and, and be, be there without using her hands. Um, because we asked the students as well to make interventions for behaviors and interactions. This is one of those examples. We have more examples. They're not all from artists, but we think they are. Next one. Um, this one is, for example, real art. This is from Facebook. This is a Dutch man making a physical distancing thing. That's the title. Um, and I think it's beautiful. You saw a couple of these uh, um, uh, projects during this Corona pandemic of people who made like big circles in all kind of design and art ways. And I think it's just a very creative way to deal with these changes in behavior and interactions that, that we have to go through um, in, uh, in, in the pandemic. And also the next one is more about um, communication and because behavior and interaction also has to do with science communication. So this is from India. Um, and it's amazing. It's a YouTube video. It's, uh, uh, by the global news and so these corona cops were in full uh, force and they were also in full dress up during the lockdown and um, uh, basically they were spraying the idea of what a virus is to people on the on the on the street dressed up as viruses you really should watch it i think it's art um, they say they're the police but it's it's great art it's amazing next one um, we also collected some artists who work with viral structure, so really the, the, the biology of the virus and um, yeah, how it looks like, um, like the protein structure. And this is by Julian Vos André. Some of you might know him. He is uh, um, more as a sculpturist, um, sculpture maker. And this um, piece consists of sculptures uh, based on 3D protein models, uh, collaborating with the um, Klaus Schulten's research group. Um, so he made like, yeah, sculptures based on protein models of filin, which are uh, the proteins which are inside this viral uh, structure, capsid. Next one. Um, next one is also beautiful. It's uh, uh, Luke Jerem. So these are artists that really work with kind of how, what does a virus look like and, and more the um, yeah, kind of object, objective aesthetics of a virus. Like this is the way you would imagine a virus, right? If you would think about it, like a ball with things. But this is also the biology of a virus with the different proteins on the, on the um, outside of it. And, um, and Luke Jerem is great. He makes all this glass artwork. So you can check his website as well. Next one. Um, next category uh, we call it Contagious Zombies, which I think is a great name. Um, actually, because I, so I didn't include many, pic, uh, uh, many uh, examples here, but we call it Contagious Zombies because the, the category is kind of about contagion, projects that deal with contagion, but also projects that deal with zombies um, because there is kind of these books about how to uh, survive in a zombie pandemic or a zombie apocalypse and kind of a zombie apocalypse when you think about it is kind of similar to a corona pandemic so there's funny parallels there as well but this project in specific is by blast theory that is speculative design studio and they did this uh, as an artist in residence at the who in 
2018, and it was based on the SARS pandemic, which uh, happened in 2003, where there was um, a Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, where uh, in this hallway, a lot of infections happened because somebody went to a, a family wedding and there were like 17 people in this hallway uh, in the hotel infected. And they kind of reconstructed this and looked at um, how contagious, how, how contagion, con, uh, contagious, um, well, kind of how a virus spreads, right? Like the air zero number and the whole principle of contagion and how it um, um, spreads. So it's a great project and check their website as well, Blast Three, I love it. And it, it's also, Weird that they did this in 2018 at the WHO and now there's a pandemic. Uh, next one. Um, next project I also really love. Uh, it's called 69 Days of Close Encounters at the Science Gallery. And by Wouter van der Broek, he also wrote a paper in this uh, about this in Leonardo. Uh, we just had Danielle here from Leonardo, so you can check the paper. And what they did, basically people had this tag. This is still from the YouTube video, so it's not the best quality, but people had this yellow tag. Um, uh, you know, like, um, uh, how do you call it? Like these cords around their necks with tags and then everybody's walking around. And it, 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 these tags measured if people were close to each other. So uh, when people encountered each other, they kind of spread this infection. And then they made kind of graphs how this digital measured infection spread over this uh, 69 days. And at some point, um, uh, of course, a lot of people happen to be uh, infected at the gallery. But I love this project and the video is also really good um, about Science Gallery, which is also a really cool gallery for science art collaborations. And this is the original one in Dublin, but there's many science galleries around the world. Um, then the next topic. This is the topic as real viral art. So these are the only projects working with real uh, viruses. We didn't find many of those. People often mention Anna Dimitrio, but then Anna Dimitrio works with plague and stuff, but these are bacteria. So, um, but this is real virus. So this is a project by Caitlin Berrigan, and she has, um, if I say it correctly, she has hepatitis C virus. And in this project, she takes her blood as kind of because blood is a, a sub is, is as a substance is a kind of symbol of vitality, uh, and she's a lifelong carrier of this virus. And then she sees it as the she, she kind of researches the sinister potential of this. So she puts this. Uh, she puts her own blood on, on plants. It's called Life Cycle of a Common Weed, and it's really a real dark project, but um, one of the only ones that really work with viruses. And the next one is from a famous bio summit artist, Günther Seifried, um, who worked with bacteriophages in this project. And bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria. And he encoded an image into DNA, which you see on the right. And then I don't know if Günther is here, but uh, he uh, in this project he used bacteriophages in the lab to edit that image in the DNA of the uh, bacteria. On the left is more like a aesthetic uh, interpretation, artistic interpretation of what happens. But on the right you see the image as well. It's called the phage simulacrum. Next one. Um, next topic is misinformation and coding information which is also a big um, um, topic with viruses because we see so many information and, and missing information going around. And it's kind of two topics. The one is about how do you get the right information? And the other one is how do you prevent kind of all these conspiracy theories from uh, going to you and from, from um, infecting you. And this is a project by Joe Davis, um, who's, uh, the bio artist or like one of the first bio artists you should all check out Joe Davis and he has his idea he posted on Facebook publicly so it's public um, he said I have an idea for a stay at home plague virus game what you do is write down everything people are afraid of in little bits of paper paper and put them into a hat invisible stuff each other chemicals environmental change liberals Trump food biotech government death the godless economic collapse the media vaccines Islam 5g the Chinese and so on then you reach into the head, take one or two, add coronavirus, and then figure out a corresponding cons conspiracy theory. And this is great. We did this with students and it's amazing. Like do this for an evening and you have so many conspiracy theories which you then can use to make art with as well. And then the next one, next project is kind of the opposite. Uh, this is interesting because this is an artist with, uh, who works with the uh, next slide. Um, 
Next slide, Kagalina. Uh, this is the artist Xi Bing, um, who works with um, uh, coding information, which is also a big topic in the uh, pandemic. And um, this is interesting because this is the book from the Sky Project, and here this basically it looks like Chinese scrolls, but actually it's gibberish. Um, so no Chinese people can read it as all. Well. But he does all this project with languages that look gibberish or are gibberish, but he has this other project, which I couldn't find now, but, which is his emoticons. And uh, Pei Ying told me that because at the start of the pandemic in, um, uh, in China, there was already news going through, but then it's very hard to communicate things when it's not uh, allowed yet to communicate. When, when the government at first said, no, nothing is happening. So it became kind of repressed. And what they did is they communicated in a way with emoticons. So they used emoticons as a language instead of Chinese. Um, instead of Chinese. So each emoticon was kind of a character. And she said this was inspired in part by artworks from Xu Bing, because Xu Bing has also this artwork which uses emoticons as a language. And he has all kind of this uh, coding information, I called it, uh, project. And I think it's also beautiful to, to think about how we can communicate when, when there's misinformation. Next. Um, uh, sixth, uh, I have seven, so this is the sixth, we're almost done. Uh, uh, category is political and economical effects. Um, I just have one project here now, which is by Delicious Risk from Herwig Turk. Actually, I couldn't find a good thing of this online, but I saw it in real life and it's really interesting because uh, at the Art and Lightning Immunology Exhibition at Waag, um, because what it did is it questioned uh, it had this video um, with a narrator and it questioned kind of the terminology we use, which often used in, in life sciences when talking about pathogens, kind of war-like synonyms. Um, like it's a war on the virus and it's a, we have to kill it. And he, he questioned these kind of synonyms. So he said it was about the immune system as well and his response to diseases, um, um, which is in a way also political, right? The language used to describe um, uh, uh, diseases and immunology. So this is the text uh, from an exhibition. So the immu immune system is described in most scientific uh, and popular text as a complex defense system. So there you see defense system protecting the body from intruders. Depending on the context source, the language used to describe the immune system commonly appropriates the terminology of warfare and aggressive conflict. And and when you when you notice this, you see it. So that's also beautiful about the project. Um, last category is vaccination. Um, I couldn't find a lot of projects to do with vaccinations, but this is quite a nice one. It's from Kai Sukoski, um, who's Finnish, and she interviewed people in the Netherlands about vaccine resistance and why they, um, why they didn't want their kids to be vaccinated. And then they, she uses interviews as the basis for artwork. She made these diagrams um, and also, uh, but these diagrams kind of translated the fears people had about vaccination. And what she also found, for example, is really interesting that um, when you don't vaccinate your child, it can become ill, right? Uh, and but it, it can also become paralyzed. But then people don't never think about that. They never think about maybe my kids can become uh, or like disabled or kind of less less healthy. They always think of it like a life and death situation. And, and she made some sketches about these. Um, Kind of the, the the metaphors people used and the way they saw they saw uh, vaccination and it's a great project. Um, this was the last project I want to show because I only had 60 minutes. So uh, to end with, I showed you all these kind of firewall art projects, which I think are worthwhile to get back into the picture because they're super relevant in talking about viruses. Next slide. Um, and do you know more firewall art? Get in touch. Uh, here's my. Info, this viral art, which you just saw, will also be online uh, pretty soon on a Google website that's being built right now. I see Jennifer already has an idea with real viruses. That's great. Keep it coming if you have more examples, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I believe we do kind of a discussion at the end of this. So keep your questions also for the end. Yes, we will look into the questions later on. Thank you so much, Roland, for, um, for presenting. And uh, now we are going to uh, hear from BioBabe. So I'm introducing um, 
the, the squat. So Jessica is a bio designer and independent researcher based in Barcelona. Um, and Tora is an experimental designer and PhD researcher based in United Kingdom. Together, they co-founded and run the collective BioBabes, which is a group of feminist makers, designers, and researchers engaged in the redesign of relations and interactions with our living environment. Their work has been exhibited most recently at the House of Electronic Art Basel and at the London Design Festival. For the project of the world, future wardrobe, they collaborated with Lara and Katrin after they met last year at the Biosummit. Lara is a material-driven designer, researcher, and textile artist. Her work proposes exploring new habitable spaces as sensory and interactive experiences to ideate better interspecies coexistence. Katrin is a textile artist and activist focused on natural material exploration and speaking dialogues between human and non-human organisms. So welcome, the floor is yours. Thanks, hi guys. Uh, so thank you for giving us this kind of platform to present our work today. So Future Wardrobe is a partnership of artists, designers and researchers who met last year at Biosummit. And we began collaborating on a project to propose a new paradigm with the textile and fashion industry. So our work um, together intersects biomaterials, tech, and collaborate, collaboration with living species to create speculative narratives of possible futures and raise awareness of opportunities related to rethinking our relationship with other organisms. So next slide, Carol. Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here joining you. Um, I'm Lara, I'm a textile artist and um, material driven designer and researcher. My practice proposed the exploration of new habitable spaces as sensorial and interactive experiences in order to add a better solutions of coexistence, blurring boundaries between materials, technology and biology and proposing new perspectives on biocentric, design. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I truly believe that through design we can open a space for dialogue between human and other living organisms. And my research, as you can see, um, always focuses on the process, not on the final product, and caring about the emotional response of each piece and merging material-based design with digital fabrication. Next slide, please. <laughs> Hi all, I'm Catherine. I am a textile artist, a costume designer, storyteller, and interspecies collaborator, and a dreamer of worlds. Uh, my work is rooted in yogic philosophy, ecofeminist principles, ritual encounters, disruptive narratives, and speculative futures. I place a lot of value on cloth as a medium for storytelling and in a deeper sense, the human and non-human act of weaving. Um, this can be a literal weaving of cloth or webs, or in a more philosophical sense, refers to the reweaving of connections and mediating encounters with our perceived other. Thank you, next slide. So the collective BioBabes was formed back in 2015 over shared interests in exploring how the interaction between Biological entities can be employed as a means to redevelop a symbiotic relationship with nature and to foster the designs of similar relations within the living and design. The name BioBabes often confuses people. So the origin is related to the idea of taking care of biological non-human babies and learning to approach these organisms as independent identities that require care and mothering to grow. So we've been experiment, experimenting with uh, biophotovoltaics and we set up an installation at the London Zoo where we used algae's photosynthesis process to capture electrons and transfer through um, interactive structure. So the design of that set setup kind of implemented energy output sensors so we could monitor the different conditions in which the algae generate energy. 
So me and Jessica have been working on this concept of giving visibility to the invisible through our design, where we magnify these microscopic entities and highlight them in wearables and jewelry pieces. We previously worked with using bioluminescent bacteria, Vibrio fishery, in wearable glass vessels, as well as working with slime molds in larger wearable glass pieces, where the organisms basically change the piece as it moves and grows within it. But these pieces, but through these pieces, we want to kind of encourage more of an interactive attention to nature by magnifying these organisms that are not normally highlighted in our environment. Next slide. So as we said before, last year, me and Jess were at the Bio Summit. Um, we we're talking about this piece that we wanted to work on for, the, for an exhibition in Basel. And we wanted to explore the idea of carrying bioluminescent dinoflagellate as they're not really visible unless they're moved around or shaken when they start to glow. So at the same time, uh, we had this discussion with Catherine, who was also at the Bio Summit, and she started telling us about this project proposal she and Lara had submitted for this idea of the future wardrobe. So basically where the pieces in your wardrobe are created in a symbiosis with living organisms. Next one. So I hope that you can see this video. Yeah. Um, so here we get to talking about the state of the art. And all of us in this group are, come from a design background in one way or another. And we realized that human-centered thinking and design has created an incomparable amount of damage to all of the interconnected webs of being and living systems that we rely on for our survival. Um, so our place as designers has to be rethought. Um, as designers, activists, thinkers, makers, citizens, artists, educators, uh, and academics, uh, is to disrupt our current systems, meaning knowledge, design, extraction, and production, to name a few, and to spark empathetic responses in times of unprecedented change and global devastation. And we think that we have a really great opportunity to rethink these relationships, restore our habitats, and rethink our future narratives for building a future together along with our non-human king. Next slide, please. I've been muted. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm the other bio babe. Sorry, I've been muted the whole time. Um, what, are, what are the new practices we need to adopt to make this shift? Future wardrobe is a critical reflection on the devastation imposed by malpractices within the textile industry. As designers, we believe we have a responsibility to meet the needs of both human and non-human organisms. So some of the questions we've been asking ourselves have been, uh, what is an interspecies collaboration? How do we develop empathetic coexistence? What are the boundaries of bio art and speculative futures? Can we consider algae, our non-human client? And how do we shift from the anthropocentric to the biocentric design? Next slide, please. So what do we mean by the biocentric design? And the shift from the anthropocentric to the biocentric design happens as we work with living algae and approach them not as a resource, but as our non-human client for whom we structure our design methods to accommodate the nurturing of its needs. Why algae? They are one of our oldest ancestors. They sparked our creation by providing an oxygen abundant atmosphere changing our world into a haven for all the variations of life today. We want to give algae the platform that they deserve. This is why algae are so great. <laughs> they, grow in, they grow in abundance um, without the need of arable land and, like other crops. So they do not use up fresh water for drinking or irrigation. 
and do not rely heavily on harmful fertilizers and pesticides for cultivation. They also efficiently sequester CO2 and aid with nitrogen fixation. And their cultivation could offer coastal communities a return to algae farming and opportunity to restore algal ecosystems. Next slide, please. Perfect. So here you see our approach, um, basically the fundamental idea behind a biocentered design is that designers need to develop an empathetic understanding of the humans, non-humans, and living systems they're designing for. And to help us in this process, we developed a conceptual business model canvas, an innovatrix, as you see on the screen here, for three species of algae clients. In our case, it was spirulina, chlorella, and bioluminescent dinoflagellates. Um, to better understand their needs and those of the human wearer of our bio-wearables. Um, so mediating mutualistic interspecies relationships means collaboration and reciprocity. That if I have an algae companion, my algae companion has a human. So for example, if our customer segment is spirulina, we know that they are high in proteins and antioxidants, are resilient and easy to grow without using up many resources, have high lipid concentration, which makes them more viable for biomass, perhaps than soybeans or corn, and have potential in environmental remediation as they have been shown to absorb metals from wastewater and radiation. So these are all positive value captures for the human, but what can we humans offer to our collaborators who are the algae? And after identifying our uh, client's needs and the current practices to satisfy these, mainly growing cultures industrially or in photobioreactors, we see there is a niche market that is untapped. And our value proposition is to create a wearable algae biome that provides the algae human assisted transportation and agitation, a chemical nutrient exchange of oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide, protection from predators, cleaning and maintenance services, creative outlet in the form of music or biosonification, and a platform for communication as we are their interspecies translators. So, next slide, please. So what is our relationship to the algae? Is it really collaborative or do we still hold more power in decision making? Next slide, please. So biosonification is part of our project. And what do we mean by biosonification? Um, we are referring here to translating changes in conductivity across two probes in our case, two electrodes using MIDI data, musical instrument digital interface for generating sound. And the purpose of adding this added layer of biosonification is that within a spectrum of what is speculative in our speculative narrative and speculative world building, we are training each other in acts of communication. So we as the creators of this technology that has been adapted for our range of sensory perception, act as the interspecies translators, meaning we're listening, recording, and evolving our ways of interpreting sound. And simultaneously, our non-human companions are adapting the sound output through their subtle voltaic fluctuations to signal and express their message to us, their human companion. Next slide, please. So our proposal is a living garment, creating a symbiotic habitable space for both algae and human as an embodiment of the vast multidisciplinary research, the government has as a discussion piece actually to raise awareness for the urgencies and opportunities related to rethinking our relationship with other organisms. So as well as the wearable biosonification system, which Catherine just mentioned, uh, we are working on two research lines and merging them all in one garment. So one is developing and optimizing our algae-based bioplastic, and the other one is our living algae system. You can see it here in the sketch, uh, like a brief sketch to represent what we are proposing. Next slide, please. So we are shifting from a linear to a circular system. 
by referring to circularity, we mean to an alternative economy where we keep resources in use for as long as possible we can and propose a soul to soil system. So far we did some biodegradability tests to be sure that the, like at the disposal stage of the material, it degrades in natural conditions and return to the soil as a fertilizer. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a video that is a sneak peek of our investigation to show how we dedicate time to research and testing, always considering the environmental impact of our material development. So this is our material, our yarns. We show the resistance of them, the hydrophobic properties. We created pouches and be sure like they keep the algae habitat inside and we create a garment out of them. So also for us, it's important that we locally source our raw material that is sodium, sodium alginate, which is found in the soil walls of brown kelp. And it grows uh, abundantly in the kelp forest in the coast of Spain, that is our bioregion. So we want to highlight the importance of sourcing locally to be accountable for the impact of, on the area, obviously. Um, moreover, our process is driven by the material research, so the technical needs are the one that guide the design of the garments, for which we combine crafting techniques as well as digital fabrication techniques to continually push the boundaries of our material. Moreover, um, the user experience is also the one that plays like a large role in our investigation as we are testing it. Uh, for comfort and functionality aspects, not only for the human wearer of these pieces, but also for our algae client, rethinking and redesigning until both human and algae needs are met. So we want to create a space for the cohabitation and coexistence, leading to a potential symbiotic system. Next slide, please. <laughs> So our materials and algae client inform our creative process. So we seek to obtain a durable material that doesn't harm the algae, but showcases the potential of our algae-based materials and hosts the algae in uh, water-resistant but biodegradable pouches. So currently, um, our module design has three layers, a woven and a breathable underlayer made from a woven algae yarn, um, to pouches the host and allow the algae to circulate through the garment and a protective outer layer made from large sheets of our material. So our idea is that the human wearer will aid in optimizing the algae's requirements for thriving environments as we propose a mutualistic nutrient exchange between the algae and the wearer. So the algae-based water-resistant pouch provides the algae community with human supported transportation and agitation for increased circulation to keep the community environment healthy and happy. So it's a transportation that aims to cater to our algae client to serve as a platform for biocentered design approach that respects restoration of our habitats and shows empathy with our non-human organisms. So next slide. How can we re-envision the future through radical collaborations? Um, on behalf of BioBabes, we would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our project with you. And we would like to invite you and open a discussion on collaborating with living organisms in a design context. So we welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Uh... Yes, and it rhymes somewhat with the panel that was before um, 
led by Carolyn. So it's really, mm, talking in between sessions. Um, so do you have guys any questions to our panelists? Like maybe let's see what's happening in the chat. Um. Hey, maybe I'll unmute and just ask a question while you're looking. You guys, that was fantastic work. That, that is just absolutely terrific in terms of uh, very much so in keeping with the line of thought that we've been doing about the nature of interaction between host and, and uh, organism. Did you say that you started that idea or that co collaboration last year at the Bio Summit with somebody and then you pulled it forward? Or I'm, I'm, I'm curious in general, I'm sure other people are about your collaboration. Super cool. Yeah, so we were kind of, well, me and Jessica from Biobase were kind of working on a project already that was kind of on this wavelength. And it wasn't until we kind of met up with uh, Catherine and started discussing this idea that we had, that we realized we have a kind of a, a similar uh, idea in mind. So yeah, we worked on it for a little bit and we ended up um, getting a, a European grant. So that's what we're developing now. So we're working on that. Um, yeah, let's go. <laughs> How that went. Fantastic. They have a question. Yeah, I posted it in the chat, but I'm just wondering after working with, you know, these three main algaes uh, for, I guess, the past year for the moment, like, do you feel like you're getting some sort of communication going with this other species, these other species? Like, is something happening? Uh, so, okay, with that, you're speaking about the biosonification module specifically. Any well, part of the process. Really. I guess that that's mainly like our proposed speculative language is like trying to make um, sort of like the invisible world of their um, like vital signs, let's say, sort of visible to us or not visible, but in, made into sound so that we can actually perceive that. Um, and it's really interesting listening to what's happening within them, but it's like not to the point yet that we have any like specific conclusions on like, what is the algae telling us? I think it is like, a, like a relationship like any other that needs a lot of nurturing and um, a lot of um, paying attention, uh, deciphering codes. Uh, and it's something that we've actually not for the past year, because that's when we sort of met and started talking about it. But only in the past like four, four months. Yeah, in the past month, we've actually started like all, our culture and the and the electronics part of it. We were working more on the material side of it before because that's, um, I guess, how we came into doing this project was like from the material exploration mainly. And um, and yeah, so it's that's a newer part of our of our um, interaction with the algae. Although Thora has been growing all these three kinds of algae and that's why we picked them specifically mm -hmm. for an uh, extended amount of time. Thank you. I look forward to hearing about the, you know, later developments. I mean, we had actually a clip that I don't think played of what um, happens when you put this, um, these vital sciences bio data through a MIDI interface, basically into like a DJ software, like Ableton or whatever else, like Animoog. Um, and uh, I don't think that it played, but you can, I mean, at some point you can just get like a monophonics. So you're just listening to one sort of note and that's like the more scientific way of doing it. I guess it's like your control, but then at some point you can also like, um, we started to record or like have like underwater sounds, which is like the sound of the algae environment um, to see if we could like, you know, speculatively stimulate a response from them, emulating sounds in their environment. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I would maybe like make a bridge if like 
if you considered uh, clients as viruses and if yes can like maybe Roland say something on behalf of viruses like the possibility of a collaboration and working for this living non-living entities yes this this was in my mind the entire time actually because just before finishing this um, presentation i had to choose because we have much more examples right than this 14 or so that i showed and one of them is this movie with a woman who thinks from the perspective of a virus so there's this narrative i am the virus and i am um, changing this world like it's like about how the viruses sent us a message and I, I think especially in the beginning of the whole pandemic there were quite some especially when there was suddenly like more fresh air for a brief period because there were no planes there were a lot of people saying like oh this is gonna change the things for good the virus was sending us a message so that is a bit that's a bit thinking from the perspective of the viruses I have one question maybe for the for the bio babes. So this innovatrix, this innovation matrix um, is really cool that you made. It's like a paradigm shift. But you think of these algae as your clients, right? These are your clients. So I was thinking maybe it would be fun to if, and I don't know if you ever considered it, to kind of work one project uh, to the end with three prototypes where you have one that's kind of only for human, one for the human and the LG clients and one only for the LG clients. Because how would something look that's only for LG? Probably we wouldn't even understand it, right? I love that approach. I think that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> I think we have to do that now alongside what we're doing um, to change it. But I think I think the idea of changing it and, and focusing on algae as the client as well is, is so different from the way that we usually design. So we design with something quite particular in mind. With we know our materials, we know how we're going to work in and put them together. But taking it from that perspective, uh, I was also seeing another uh, question in here. Um, like biocentric approach is basically starting for, from the organism and what the organism wants, at least from from my perspective and our perspective and then building what we can can for them. So this kind of vehicle or, or an item of clothing or garment in this sense, um, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, that was like, I think you were referring to uh, Eduardo uh, question. Um, I think that we kind of show like wrapping up this session. So. And last question, like anyone? I don't see any new questions. Um, please, but let, let's let's uh, talk uh, on Slack still. And you have contacts to Roland and to BioBabes. And, and I'm curious like uh, to learn more uh, about the like, possibilities of working for this invisible uh, clients.